Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. I said good morning then, but let me, do, let me try this again. This meeting will start. Thank you, everyone, for um, coming today for our work um, session. I will call this meeting to order. Public comments. Do we have public comments? Clerk? Yes, ma'am. We have three individuals. Okay, we have three individuals who have signed up this morning. And um, the first person we have is Mr. John Tomaski. Uh, Mr. Tomaski, come forward. Let me ask that your comments uh, be limited to your discussion and not uh, <coughs> geared toward elected officials or anyone else uh, in, this, in this meeting. So I'm not sure what your Oh, you have roads this morning. Is that what you want to talk about? Please. Good morning, everyone. John Tomaski, 29th Post Road. First, I wish to thank the uh, four district commissioners and the chairman for the kind letter addressed to my son. He's unable to be here today as he's occupied with official business today and tomorrow. Uh, so I am thanking you on his behalf. On the subject of roads, I was at the first uh, session on the <coughs> adjustments to overpasses that was held at Mason Creek School. And I have three reactions to that. Uh, first is uh, that there should be appropriate legislation, federal, state, or county as appropriate, <coughs> that governs the operation of vehicles on the public highways, uh, length, width, height, weight, that sort of thing. Uh, secondly, uh, law enforcement at uh, state or county level should be cognizant of these regulations and enforce them. Third, while I was at uh, the Mason Creek uh, event, th there was no formal presentation, in answer to a question by another resident, the uh, GDOT employee said that the genesis of all of this was that a tall rig had been unable to pass under an overpass in South Georgia, doing considerable damage to the overpass. So that they were now proposing to jack up several overpasses in West Georgia. I then asked whether the cost of that was going to be borne by the trucking industry or the general public. Of course, it's going to be on the backs of the general public. At that point, I left the meeting, and as I was leaving, I saw Mr. Lennon coming in. Possibly he got that same information, possibly not, depending where you were and who you asked. In any event, it is not the responsibility of the general public to pass legislation or to enforce it. So the parties responsible for those things need to do a better job. Rather than go through all of this expensive construction, which is going to greatly delay and inconvenience people, the GDOT person estimated it would be like 40, 45 days per overpass. Whether doing current, cur concurrently or not, I don't know. But that's quite a lot of time. And this is not the sort of priority as I-85 collapsing in Buckhead. This is a few overpasses out in West Georgia. So this is going to be an enormous inconvenience. And I think it's unnecessary. First of all, if your rig is too tall to go under, you don't belong on the road. Secondly, you can get off, go up the ramp, across the road, down the next ramp, back onto the highway. And finally, for safety reasons, rather than reconstruct the overpass, you can build a barrier through which traffic must pass and you have it at the same height as that overpass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tomasi. Okay, next we have uh, Ms. Don Raymond. Thank you so much. Uh, 
and I believe your <laughs> subject matter this morning is buses. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name and, um, and your address for us, please. Good morning. My name is Dawn Ray Leonard, Creekside Manor Subdivision in District 2. In Douglas County, we are diverse in our ages, races, genders, neighborhoods, and economics. But in all aspects of this bus project, there is a prevailing theme that cuts across all lines in this county. That theme is simply no buses. Clearly, the arguments against the proposed bus system are many. Let me recap a few of them. There was no feasibility study conducted. If you have done it, we would love to see it. There was a 2016 needs wants based study that you have paraded as a feasibility study with 1,400 <coughs> participants. That equals approximately 1% of the county. City of Douglasville was not consulted, much less involved in the planning, but will be responsible for costs to support this bus system. In addition, the City of Douglasville did not give their approval for the buses, and even though Douglas County Board of Commissioners said they did in the CMAC application, was this fraudulent information submitted on a federal application to secure a grant. Show the public where the city signed off on that. The BOC did not vote for the four route system. You can dance around this one all you like. It was unlawful, non-transparent, and the Transportation Committee and the Transportation Department are responsible for this ruse and the board allowed it to happen. There was no cost analysis conducted. No one in this room can tell us how much this bus system is going to cost. Even Gary Watson said we did not know until after we received the CMAC grant. I expect to know the cost before I make a decision to buy in. What will the financial impact of this bus system be on the taxpayers? The change.org petition for no buses as of today has generated 4,512 signatures. Douglas County Sentinel survey has excuse me, 505 participants to date, 89.4% voting no. Survey of people attending Commissioner Mitchell's coffee and conversation this weekend, over 90 people, over 90% of the room opposed the BOC accepting the CMAC grant. You have a duty and obligation to the citizens of this county to uphold the rule of law when conducting county business. Policy and procedure have not been followed. You know it and we know it. We've asked you to retract the CMAC application. You refuse. Again, we implore you to vote no on the CMAC grant. We can only pray that this board does the right thing in the end. Chairwoman Jones, this baby does indeed belong to you now. You inherited this project from the previous administration and you have done your research, but your research is flawed. This project is dead on arrival for the citizens of this county. Listen to the people. They are saying no to this bus proposal and no to this CMAC grant. That's it. That's it. That's Thank over. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Leonard, we will take your concern under advisement. Last but not least, Ms. Elizabeth Pierce. Appears if you would state your name just last but not least. <laughs> oh, I like those words. Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglas Street, Georgia. I was up at four o'clock this morning. Taking my notes. I got them right here. Now what they basically pertain to is Mr. Bussey on the 14th. Now, Mr. Bussey is supposed to be the spokesperson for the corner, right? He was hired. Now, the first thing I want to clear up, because during my lawsuit, I did a lot of investigation, and then it was dismissed, and that's fine and dandy. But the truth of the matter is, when he said the cooler, cooler, mini morgue, whatever you want to call it, where bodies go, it's going to save the county money. Let me tell you something. That's about like saying I'm going to have some more children, so it's going to save me some money. Don't fly. First statement he made is he said there's a charge from the other funeral homes. No, 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 no. 
I've talked at length with Mr. Andrews over at Hightower. There has never been a charge. It's always been complimentary. Okay? Never been a charge. All of them have coolers, except Willie Watkins. They don't have a cooler. Now, the other thing he spoke about is that we've got a cooler. Okay, we've got one. And he invited some of you to come down. So I went over there and I looked at it. And he said, I can't see inside of it because there's a body in it. I said, okay, I just want to see outside. So I had someone with me to make sure that I wasn't going to get assassinated by anybody. So I had a man with me about the size of Sheriff Pounds. After that little viewing, I had to pick up some papers and I went over to the top to the chief, <coughs> fire chief. Unplanned, he came out and talked to me. I said, Chief, uh, you heard Mr. Bussey say we got a cooler? Yeah. I said, you know where it is? No. I said, where do you think it is? He says, I don't know. He, he never said where it was at. Well, it's underneath the old courthouse, behind those two metal doors. Okay? That's where it's at. It's actually, it's actually directly under the break room. When you pull the Coke machine out and you take a drink of Coke, they're right under there. All right. All kind of problems with the cooler, but I'm not getting into that. Okay? That's for another day. But I'm going to tell you something. And Madam Chair, I ask that you let me go into this to some degree because you're never going to hear it again. And that is, this poet wrote something that pertains to everyone who's ever done things. And that is, oh, what a tangle web we weave when we practice to deceive. Now, you know, some people don't know what they're doing. Some people think they know what they're doing. And it's y'all's job to know what you're doing. Mr. Mitchell, you've been in marketing. You know how to analyze things. And others have been around a long time. We're 18 months into the practice, which is one-third. Okay? One-third. In one-third of the time, if you haven't figured out what's going on, then you just need to leave. Now, what's going on is the practice that when they bring bodies now, he said they're going to save the county money. Ha! <laughs> you got to see what I got here. I got charges to the county, to the county coroner. Cooler. Yep. They're still charging $100. Okay. It's right here. Now, I want to I jump over the router for just one minute. This is going to finish it up. You, you had four minutes. I went over to see. You have one minute, one second. I went over to see <laughs> the cooler again. Mm -hmm. and while I was there, Mr. Rogers said, I don't have a key. I said, oh, so he called the corner, and the corner said, Mr. Pierce has already seen the cooler. He doesn't need to be around there no more. Well, let me tell you what's going Mr. on. Mr. Pierce. Yes, you had almost five minutes. Let me let me just finish this one sentence, please. Mr. Pierce, you're finished. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Mr. Pierce, I've given you almost five minutes to do this, so you're finished. Please just wrap it up with your last sentence. I'll allow you to wrap up your last sentence. Can I say finish it? Yes. Yeah. Finish okay. your last sentence. Go. On. Mr. Axel earned in the last pay period five thousand four hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and Mr. Rogers earned one thousand one hundred and forty. The locks were changed. In the doors. Mr. Rogers can't get in. Okay? So he can't do his job. Now, it's up to y'all to figure out what the heck's going on, okay? okay? And I use the word heck lightly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Pierce will take this matter under advisement. Oh, I wish so you much. would. I am. I'm going to give a presentation in a second so that I can readdress your concerns. Because I'll tell you what. Um, just the, start to rain. the next presentation is from the coroner, but, but she's not here yet. So what I want to do is move forward with the presentation that I have so we can move forward. So, um, do we, can we put that on for me? So we get started. She, she should be here hopefully in a second. Did you have an opportunity to speak with her? She didn't. Okay. okay. Where's it going? Could you, um, could you give, Miss, if you could.
by commissioners and come around. I didn't hear what you said. You said you wish we would take it under advisement. I said I'm going to take it under advisement. Uh -huh. Thank you. working the board. I would just like to say again, good morning, Board of Commissioners and the citizens of Douglas County. It is my fiduciary responsibility to separate emotions from responsibility. Responsibilities, and I said leaders don't react, they research. After many hours of comparing bookkeeping and recording um, record keeping practices of the, current, of the current and previous coroner, I am prepared to render my findings. Commissioner Guider, I can't agree with you more that coroners should conduct a sign-off investigation, particularly if they are at the scene, rather than paying a deputy coroner $175 fee. Being that Coroner Renee Godwin is a part-time salaried elected official, you and I know that it is impossible for her to conduct all death investigations in the county because death occurs around a full-time clock. Without a doubt, the number of investigations or death investigations invoices per $175 process for deputy coroners in the finance department was higher in 2017 than 2016. Death investigations conducted by the coroner has no budget impact and the finance department does not receive an invoice and the number of and that's by the coroner. Now the coroner, because I remember all the death investigations and the invoices that we pay there for the deputy coroners. So right now there's no way to really track to see how many death investigations are conducted by our coroners because no invoices are submitted to our finance department. To say uh, that there were more deaths in 2016, uh, no, 2017 versus 2016 uh, is not a logical uh, answer. Um, what I do have is, a, is an overview here. I had an opportunity for uh, to look at both uh, coroners because in order to determine who's doing the right thing, you have to look at each coroner to determine uh, the best approach and the best method because if we're going to utilize uh, our previous coroner as, as the standard of excellence, I wanted to make sure that I understood his practice. So if you look here, it says uh, Coroner Renee Garvin's budget review. And I had an opportunity, I work with finance, I serve on the finance committee. And on May 14, 2018, the finance committee reported that uh, Renee Godwin's budget, and I'll just read it verbatim, reported coroner Renee Godwin's budget is slightly over target at 1.72%. This is down from the previous month's variance of 3.10%. And coroner Godwin has 61% of her budget remaining to operate through December 31st, 2018. And so right now she has 61% of that budget still remaining today to operate. And the next um, bone of contention, 2018, the annual budget, her budget is $195,000. Year-to-date expenses as of 5-9-18 is $68,360. She has some uh, year-to-date encumbrances. And then her remaining budget is $120,520. Uh, to operate for the rest of the year. And I'm just going to find my PowerPoint. The next slide, if you look at the next slide, I looked at her operation. I wanted to take a look at that operation because I owe the citizens this. And the overall appearance of the office is organized, clean, and efficient. It's automated operation with computerized hard copy documents. Records management practices align with best practices files are system, uh, systemized and um, easily accessible. Coroner deputies uh, and the deputy coroner's credentials 
They are trained and sworn in to conduct death investigations, transports local in and out of the county. Uh, using 21st century uh, automated coroner, they are using a coroner ME software application to compute required information related to death investigations into the Georgia vital record system. There's a sign-in process for individuals entering the coroner's office and aspiring, uh, and right now I understand that this coroner's office is aspiring to be the first coroner's office in the state of Georgia to obtain, uh, to obtain accreditation status. When I look at, um, I made some bu budget recommendations to the coroner, purchased six metal trays, as this is what they needed to do. We brought those trays in overnight. I asked my county administrator to work with me to increase capacity to hold the deceased citizens prior to being transported to GBI. That's been done. This will ultimately reduce <coughs> transport fees and take some pressure off the budget expenses. The pauper funerals, which are uh, cost $995 for indigent cis, uh, citizens, in 2016 were about $32,000, and in 2017 uh, is $36,000, which is still, the correlation is still pretty close. This is an expense that is unpredictable, and the invoices are generated to the coroner's office by funeral homes. And then I said last on this slide is death investigations expenses were targeted as an opportunity for process improvement. The coroner is an elected official and I cannot dictate how she run her office. However, I believe she respect my experience with controlling budget expenses. Budget expenses. I recommend that Coroner Garwin set targets for the number of deaths that she conducts and set off uh, per month for those death investigations and also for the deputy coroners. When she is on site, she must conduct that uh, according to Georgia law, Code 45. She has to conduct the death investigation, but if she's not on site and her deputy coroner's there, he or she must perform the death investigation. Mind you, your coroners, your deputy coroners are sworn in by state law. Uh, they have to be sworn in by the state law, um, by judge, because they act um, in a similar role as a coroner when they're out conducting uh, death investigations. Um, and she'll be here in five minutes and I'll be talking. Let's look at this again. No, go back to that slide. Yeah. So if you look at your coroner, the current coroner, 2017 and present, Rogers is a regular part time. We have Axley, regular part-time, Ushery, regular part-time, and we have Bussy, which is a part-time administrator for the office. But if you look at the previous coroner, which was from 2012 to 2016, we had Axley Transport, Mitchell, uh, the person's name was Nathan Mitchell, he was the deputy coroner. Then we had Georgia Decon LLC, and we had, it, it flipped, the, the uh, name changed in 2013 to Georgia Floors and More. So that is not a name, that is a company. We'll go to the next slide. I noticed some differences in operations. Death investigations, the current coroner is charging $175, and this is what she charges, and I had a concern because when I looked at the previous coroner there, his uh, investigations were $100. So I wanted to make sure that uh, someone, or I wanted to make sure that we were at were within the line of, my question is why? I said, why is she charging 175 and he's charging 100? Well, she is adhering to the Georgia Code 45, OCGA 45-16, 2017, that says a deputy coroner shall be paid $175. This, this law was enacted in 2007. Uh, it, in fact, I'll read it to you. It says, on and after January 1st, 2007, coroners shall be entitled to investigation fees of $175. Now remember our coroners are, they are actually salaried, but let me flip to the one that talks about the deputy coroner. And it says such fees shall be paid to the deputy coroner of $175 as well for their services. So that is what, she, so she is actually charging what she's supposed to charge by Georgia state law. Part-time employee agreements have been made under her side, if you look here, Part-time employment agreements have been made and entered into between Douglas County, I got count, Georgia through the Board of Commissioners and signed off by the Chairman. All the agreements, part-time agreements, have come through the Board of Commissioners. And if you flip on the other side, previous coordinator, contracts 
with Georgia Decon LLC and Georgia Floors and Moors did not come before the Board of Commissioners, and that is a third party contract. And it is as in, and that contract should have come before the Board of Commissioners if it's a contract. Only thing that we could find is a vendor application. The vendor application talks about crime scene pickup. It, 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 that's the, the principal line of responsibility for this particular company was crime scene cleanup, uh, carpet cleaning, and duct cleaning. So that is volume, and I, I have the law here. That is volume 11, uh, resolution page th th uh, 3868. I'll be willing to share that. And my Board of Commissioners, please feel free to look through your packages. So all third party, the law says, all third party contracts and obligations of the coroner's office shall be first approved by the Douglas County Commissioners in order to bind funds in Douglas County. There, and there's no record of training. If we look at Georgia Floor, Floors and more, whoever that is, there's no record of training. So, but it was, I was able to drill down to a particular name. But the person was trained in 2013. I mean, they started services in terms of death investigations. When you're performing death in investigations, you're actually touching these deceased patients. You're taking photographs. So you have to be credentialed and trained. I've been in the healthcare industry over 40 years. I understand healthcare very well. And uh, we have uh, licensures and we have certifications to touch these patients, such as my deputy coroners, who have to be trained who have to be uh, astute in uh, making decisions and signing off. And I know that Georgia Floors and Moors did not sign off on a death investigation. You cannot use that and sign off on death, death investigation, that name. There's no records to show that Georgia Floors and Moors were sworn in by our judges, and they provided services here in the county for three years from 20, well really, yeah, 2013 to 2016. They're no longer, as of 2016, they're no longer here. Next slide. Differences, the record management and maintenance of the death-related records are in compliance in the current office. Uh, there's also a 50-year retention on records. I ran the, the Department of the Navy program uh, for environmental asbestos-related records, and they're required to be stored for 50 years. And also sterilization records in healthcare, all types of records related to patient care. Uh, especially ones such as death investigations have to be retained for 50 years. I, uh, the previous coroner record management and maintenance of death related records are missing and unavailable at this time. I'm trying to find them and I'm still working on that part because it's a, it's a state law. You have to, those records, so I'm looking for them. Uh, we won't make any quick judgments, but I am in the process of trying to find those death investigations. I, were, I was able to put the, my hand on the ones that are in uh, Godwin's office, her office is fresh and new, so of course it was easy to put my hands on hers, but I could not find the other records, and I am looking for those at this time. My overall assessment, Coroner Renee Godwin, operations aligned with the uh, 2010 Georgia Title 45 OCGA 45 1627, and she is paying her deputy coroners $175 for investigations as specified by OCGA 45-1627. Renee Godwin's three deputy coroners have been officially sworn in by a judge to perform their duties and their part-time deputy coroner contracts have been officially approved <coughs> by the Board of Commissioners. Record management processes are being performed in accordance to state and federal law. It's a 50-year permanent record compliance requirement. Coroner Renee Gowan is responsible for conducting death investigations when present at the scene instead of her deputy coroners, as I said er earlier, and the deputy coroners performs investigations in her absence. Based on my comparison and analysis of the current and previous coroners' administrative practices, there were several irregularities identified in the previous coroners' operation and I owe the Board of Commissioners and the citizens of Douglas County assurance that a thorough investigation will be conducted by the proper authorities. In a nutshell, the implications that there were more deaths in 2016, uh, 2017 versus 2016, is it can, we cannot trace that right now because I can't find the uh, death investigations that were conducted by the previous coroner so I could compare those numbers, so we don't want to make any false assessments. 
But at this time, I just want to let you know I'm still looking for records, records by the state uh, for Georgia uh, state uh, and its law and its federal law that I have to have those records. So I'm looking for those records and I'll uh, report back as soon as possible. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Guy. Should I come up here? Sure. <coughs> to compare 2016 or 2017. I'm up here to talk about what is happening in the office now. And um, I have to say that anytime somebody comes to me and gives me anything that might be innuendo or personal opinions or what, <clears throat> I always check it out. I do not take people uh, are especially on a hot issue just at, uh, uh, just what someone tells me because it could be rumor. Uh, Miss, Miss Chairman, you're wrong. The death certificate tells you who pronounces the death. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to the um, probate office, this is not my Ann's figures. These are the probate figures. Renee Godwin has not pronounced a death in about six to eight months. About six months. Let's, let's give her the benefit of the doubt. Uh, if you Google her name, she popped up as working full-time at Hateful, at the city of Hateful. She was also driving the county car over there. Now, I had pictures. I have pictures of the county car sitting in the personnel uh, pen. But I also went and checked the fleet tickets to show how many miles she was putting on the car. And I assure you, she was not just driving here in Douglas County in the county car. Uh, during the week of March the 10th or the 9th, she put over 1,000 miles on the county car. Now, she had to go out of state to do that. But I am not after her. I am try I turned it over to the DA because that puts it in neutral ground. I don't want it to be political. I am not comparing uh, 2016 to 2017. I'm just looking at her figures. I gave it to the law enforcement because I am not an attorney. I do not know the difference or the fine line between being unethical and illegal. <clears throat> That's not my job. I'm not a, 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 an attorney. So I turned it over to the attorneys to do that. They are doing an investigation. But um, <clears throat> Mr. Bussey has not been sworn in. This came from the probate judge this morning. Well, he's not a court. He's driving. He's wearing a badge. Uh, and I might call on the sheriff here. <laughs> The deputy sheriff, can you carry a badge and have lights on your car if you're not a sworn deputy? It's a question I'm not prepared to answer right now. Okay. But we need to look at that. Plus, Mr. Bussey has a cloud over his past that you might want to look at <coughs> since he's driving one of our cars. Um, the state of Georgia uh, does not belong to the organization that. Uh, Miss Godwin attended in Las Vegas. They don't belong, in fact, there's not but 10 states in the whole uh, uh, United States that belongs to that organization. She was just uh, two or three months into the, um, her job, and she goes outside to Las Vegas on a very expensive trip to an organization that we don't even belong to. It wasn't her required training, um, but the fleet tickets will tell you a lot about her vehicle. I have the fleet tickets if you want to look at them. Um, when she came before us in 2017 and asked for all these deputies, she used wrong figures. 
I have proof of that from the probate court. She said there were 70-something deaths in the months of January and February. There was only 30-something. So she enticed us with wrong data. So that kind of puts us in a uh, kind of embarrassing situation, too. Uh, Georgia, Decon, and, and Flores is actually Mark Alcaraz, mm -hmm. who was a deputy. Mm -hmm. He was sworn in. And he didn't train until 15. I don't know about the training, but I'm just saying he, he that's his business, that was his business to clean up uh, crime scenes. But I'm not going to compare uh, what happened in 2017, 2018. Cremations. Um, Jennifer, you just gave me a report recently. The cremations are pretty well on track. Uh, they're about a third of the budget that she has spent. <coughs> Madam Chair, you sat there at the last meeting and said that's why her budget was running over. It had nothing to do with cremations. It has to do with gasoline and her part-time employees. She is utilize, utilizing her, her deputies to do all of her work. Until recently, she um, informed one of them that she was going to have to cut their hours because she was being forced to do some of the investigations. The Sheriff's Office also has a report that tells what coroner shows up out there. And I did just about three months of them. She showed up on maybe four or five, but she didn't do the reports. She didn't do any of the reports. She uh, she let somebody else do it. That was that also showed up on the scene. Like I say, if she shows up on the scene, she should be doing the reports. But she should not be using a county vehicle for her personal use. And I want to know where she went the, on March the night the week of March the 9th, because she was not at training, according to finance. But I do check my figures. Mm -hmm. I don't take anybody's word for anything when it comes to uh, the business of this county. I have to check it out myself. And I've talked with the, uh, I've gotten records from the probate office, I've gotten records <laughs> from the fleet, and everything shows that there's an abuse of, of a, a vehicle that she has been given. Anyway, I, I have one slide that I didn't Very have good. an opportunity to stretch this. Mm -hmm. Just don't come down and touch it. If we just, and I know Commissioner Bowdy said she didn't compare, but the only way I could get to a, 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 a reasonable, reasonable answer, I had to compare because I just can't go one side. I'm very impartial. I'm very fair. So I wanted to look at both sides. So if I looked, and I, I don't have a dog in the fight. All I'm doing is giving the facts and all of the citizens of Douglas County a response. When you look, if you look at these investigations, Georgia Floyd Moore, Georgia Floyd Moore, and Axis and Nathan, they get a total from 2013 is when Georgia Floyd Moore came on. It was 578 total. And the charges were about $100. And if you look at it, if you, if this was $100, this is this fee total, if you add all this up, this is based on $100 for death investigations. But if you had really been following the state law of $175, it would be $101,150. And that's why Godwin's uh, budget is up because she is paying her coroners, her deputy coroners, $175 according to Georgia state law. So this is $63,000. So quite naturally, it's going to appear that your budget is looking a lot better and you're performing better when actually you're not, you're not paying your deputy coroners, whoever this person is, you said uh, Alper is, you're paying him $100 and really you're supposed to pay him $175, but that's for a whole new discussion. So if you look at this total, this is really what should have been paid, $101 instead of $63. So to really say that her budget is all, we really don't have a baseline. It's not a baseline there. To really say if you look at that trend there. So we, we need to, to say, is there really a baseline? Absolutely not, because he didn't pay the right amount to his deputies, so we don't have anything really to compare with. So with that being said, anybody else have anything? Commissioner Robinson. 
You're going to sit for me? You're talking? I don't want to stand up. Okay, good. Not, and I'm if that's okay with you. Permission. No, you're fine. I'm going to sit down. All right. We're not trying to make it that type of show. Um, Can you speak up, please? Can you show? Everybody calm down. I'm no, I, I just can't hear you. I never no, no, I'm, you. I'm, I'm doing with the table. I'm, I'm, saying I'm just not going to make it type of, that type of show. Which I just don't want to stand up, please. This is not about me. I don't, don't, don't make it so defensive. I can't hear you now. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Um, I'm going to speak as much as I can, so please pay attention. I, I, in listening to this, I'm going to pick back up where I left off at. All right. Um, be definitive about what you say. Uh, the, the coroner provides a very, very important function to the county. It, my last comments that were sort of construed, it's not a dismissiveness about what it is by size. It's $200,000. It's about structure. It's not very complex, right? I mean, you guys know how it is. When you look down, it's eight quarters, which is but $2. It doesn't take a rocket science so I can take five quarters off the table just like that to sort of sort of get what this is really about, <coughs> right? So I, I want to come back to, you know, I, again, I, I know there's a lot of innuendo, um, a lot of messaging, um, a lot of slamming in the media. You know, I just, I just don't run from it. I just call it like I see it because I'm like, okay, all right, we get it. Good, good, good video clip. Great. But it didn't change the point. It's like, but it still didn't change that, okay, the math is still what it is. I, I'm going to stand on the side that you have to look at historical, okay? That's important, right? You've you got to understand the context of where you're coming from. Like, okay, are you performing or not performing? To be convenient to only look at today is like, okay, well, you can do that, as, as, as my District 2 person would say. Yeah, you can say whatever you want to say. Yes, you can. But it doesn't mean that I have to agree with your assertions, right? So I'm, I'm listening to this about this corner. I'm like... Gosh, y'all have really pushed this to, to a place like, you really want to go here? Did you, did, did, did the county really need to come here? I, I agree with you, right, you don't want to go backward. I know why you don't want to go backward. I get why y'all were defending the power corner. I get the relationships. We get it. But it's like, is this really necessary for the county? Right, we, we, we took that audit, <coughs> the transitional audit, all the way to the point where we assumed responsibility for the county. And we came with the spirit like, okay, there was someone was like, no, take it out. All the way. Prosecute. All the way. Right? And it was like, no, let's be calm. Let's, let's, let's transition properly. Everybody's new. We had across the board, new sheriff, new chair, new everybody. Everybody was like, we got to come in. The question was, did this, now again, I'm on the Congressional General Assembly, you know, I, I get to come and look at what the administration, so the question is, what did the administration do to onboard new countywide people? Who sat down and took the chair, the sheriff, the tax commissioner, and the coroner through a process so they can appreciate everything that needs to be done? Who sat down and explained to them what our vehicle process is? I'm talking loud enough just so everybody can hear, not that I'm animated. Um, who did that? Who sat down and said, okay, well, you have options. You can get a car, but you know we do have car allowances, right? Who sat down? Whose responsibility within the administration? Look, I'm part-time. I show up, but y'all tell me to show up every now and then. Right? You know, every now and then I got to come in and check and inspect any office, any record at any time. Right? All right, so I come in, I check. I like, so who properly brought these new administrators in to really understand their options? Or do we just have sort of what, you know, we just would convene and let them find their own way. That's typically why you have transition teams that bring in with leadership. They bring their own team in. Because you have typically, or you know, you have what they call administrative obstruction, internal bias. All those things exist right here in Douglas County. I'm not playing with what I'm looking at. I mean, I'll let y'all go on, do your jerk, do all your, your dancing. It's like, okay, all right, don't, I'm just gonna sit back and look at this. And it's like, okay, what I, what I see is, you can do what you want to do as elected officials. Everybody can weigh in from their perspective. Um, it's not that I'm not concerned. Um, I, I don't agree that um, the coroner should have um, given the car to her assistant, whatever his role was. And the reason is that, but she did have a policy that was written. 
And I'm like, well, who in the administration sat down with her and said, well, we got a policy. Now remember, our, we're the highest governing authority at the local level, so then ours would override that. But in the absence of that, she created her own. She was compliant with her policy. But who from the administration went across there and did that? That's not my job. Right? So, so who took their responsibility to reconcile this? I have a problem with that. Right? All right, so it's like, okay, well, you know, you need to take that back now. That, 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 that I don't, even Kelly Robinson doesn't agree that that person can't have a car. Unless they're on assignment, but they, you can't assign them one. So that's one. How do you do it? You got to take a hit for the team on that one. Right? Um, as it relates to, again, whether a person can have a car or not, how they use it, I mean, um, that's up to them. Right? They got to be responsible for that. I think there's a policy um, that, that speaks to cars and usage. Um, but then we do allow um, certain, like the sheriff, they get, their big, they get to do what they want to do with their cars. Now, they may have an additional vehicle. I'm not getting into that. I'm not trying to. But I'm saying they have choices, right? But I'm saying take it off the table and just give them a car allowance and then it's a new point. Like other people that are here in the county, you have options. Next, I'm gonna just go finish with the, the five things that were certain last week. The third one, this whole notion of using deputies and that we, you know, this whole, and again, I'm just, I, I listen to the, we don't have to do it the way it was done for 50 years. You don't have to maintain the status quo. You have a newly elected person who came in and says, I want to do it this way. I want to make sure that everybody has a death certificate. My father died in 2012, but I'm sitting up there in Cleveland, Ohio. He died of cancer. We're in Cleveland. You know, I'm in there. Like, oh, I'm down there with a medical examiner. So I, I, know, like, I know first, I'm like, okay, so we're going to do it. I'm like, I don't know. My sister looking at me. She's the caregiver, but I'm, for whatever reason, they think I'm supposed to be that guy. And like, no, I'm having like, but I want to know what that is, just like I want to know my birth certificate when I see my father and my mother and all that. I want certified. So I think if she's bringing that to the table that you've never done, that, I said, I like that. <laughs> that there needs to be a medical exam for everybody. Send the body over there and come back and give a record. That's fine. Yes, it's going to cost more than the prior administration, but that's the way she wants to do it. That is fine. Just because he did, I'm not going to maintain the prior administration's views on things. That's what the whole point. You hired new people. Why would we maintain the status quo? They hired her 140,000 people. The majority says, well, she has an idea. She has a vision for how she wants to do it. And she said what she was going to do, and she's doing it. So the fact that now that's more expensive is like, well, no, I knew what I was signing up for one more time. I paid attention to what was happening. Now, we're going to keep going. This whole notion of whether or not she should pick up bodies or not, and all this, which you was the, the, the conversation about when she's a woman, she don't have to pick up a 200 pound body. What, do y'all know what they really do? And so she uses deputies. That's fine. Now, I agree with Madam Chair, and I agree with Madam Guider that, okay, now if you're on site, you got to sign off on that. But just like the sheriff, <coughs> the sheriff can, and no offense to my, dep my deputy, so, but I'm using the sheriff just loosely. The sheriff can um, arrest you and put you in handcuffs, or he can use his deputies, right? I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think he still has the power if he wanted to actually arrest somebody. He could. The same thing with the DA. The DA can go over there and argue a case within the Superior Court or he can get his ADs. Right? Tell me if I'm wrong. Likewise, the coroner can, like, she can either do it herself or she can use her deputies. Now, why, why are we being convenient and trying to say, you're trying to marginalize and say that she only supposed, like, no, I'm not buying that, that narrative. She is not boxed and we only do this. She can run it the way she wants to. She is across a countywide seat. So why are we taking this position that she has to do it your belief way? <clears throat> I'm not buying that. I, I won't support that. I'm not hearing her defense, but I'm hearing for what I see from District 2. It's like, no, she gets to do it her way. Just like people can say what they want to say, she can run it her way. And if she wants to outsource something, it's fine. If the prior guy wanted to go and pick people up, that was his choice. Last point about the money. Always follow the money. Right, so. But the last thing that, that came to my attention, again, I really had no opinion. Again, just contrary to, again, one more time, to the dismissiveness, which I, I thought was somewhat insulting. Last time the court couldn't be here, so it was, it was brought to my attention right before the court not, not here. I said, okay, we can't cancel this. We, we got to allow the public to, to, to hear this. So I, I became the second to Madam Chair, like, no, Madam Chair, we gotta have, we, we've got to have that audience. One more time. I enabled that. That's like, no, they need to get somebody over here. It's that important to the public. Oh. It was that important. 
So here we are in full circle, right? And so now we're here in this meeting, and what was important to say, okay, what the guy said at the meeting, which I do appreciate him, I don't remember, it doesn't matter, they were just up there talking. And he said, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be paid this, and I was only paid that. And my issue is, wait a minute, there's a variance in pay? Is there not a labor law? Whoa, wait a minute, we got contracts out there that one sign up? Now, where's the check and balance with the administration, right? So, uh, again, my, my um, director of purchasing is not here, but I had this conversation with him last week. He said, Commissioner Robinson, go ahead and say what you got to say. Because he said, hey, I brought this up to the administration that I thought that that was wrong. You got to remember that. He, he mentioned it. I said, look, Director Peacock, I heard you. I'm going to bring this up next week. He said, go ahead. I said, I'm not, this ain't about you. The fact is, is that why are y'all running money through this? It's like somebody, it's like, this is wrong. Right? And then you're not paying people in it. And then I'm looking at this list of, of reports. Like, let's just keep the math like, okay, so you're paying some people above 175. You're paying some people below 100. I'm like, where the money? You keeping the margin? Now, I'm not a criminal investigator, but I, I am good at like, okay, I know where this is about to go. Y'all are playing with this. Y'all take this to a place that was like, ooh, really? We can pretend like, okay, I'm just not gonna listen to that, la, 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 I'm not gonna listen to the other side. Like, guys, is this what you really wanted? Right? I mean, the, and then the, uh, wait, the undertone is so bad. And I'm like, guys, come on, we can do better than this. And, and then sometimes you can't even pull up. I know sometimes we're down in the path, guys, I'm looking at you. Know, we're down the path like, gee, we, we're already down that path. You can't pull up. <coughs> you can't pull up. So my problem is I'm going to ask my, my um, director of finance um, that based on what Madam Chair just said, and I saw the numbers, it looks like that based on the prior coroner's budget, which we were basing things on, I'm going to ask two questions. Have there ever in the history of the prior coroner has a director or anybody in this county gone over budget? Yes. Okay. And does that happen more than once a year at any given one person? I mean, not all the time, but just... Yes. Good. And do we normally monitor this in the finance committee meeting that it is recognized that there is somebody who's over? Yes. Okay. And is there normally conversation of corrective or not corrective, or is there some type of explanation that exists within the finance report to talk about those variances? Yes, we talk about the explanations and if it's going to smooth out before the end of the year. Before it's smooth out the end of the year. So if I give you a budget like any other constitutional officer, like you directors, you've got your budget to manage. Okay. Isn't that not an expectation? We allow you to manage it, you got to the end of the year. Now, the way you're tracking, you will go off the cliff, but right now we won't allow it. Um, I look at the same thing. Have we ever had anybody, whether it's constitutional, state, director, come at the end of the year and all of a sudden, like, oh my God, I'm over budget? Have we ever had an instance of that? Yes, we have. Okay. Um, I can think of one, maybe infrequently, on the judicial side, every year there's conflict attorneys. There's no way to estimate how many people got, as you know, there's a state law that says what? that every child, right, every child, every parent, grandparent, whatever the guardian is, everybody gets an attorney. And there's no way to estimate that. No more you can estimate the number of deaths. You guys are playing with numbers just like that. You, you can only do the best that you can, but you can't anticipate them. Every year, we say, well, we understand that there's a variance on the judicial side, what do we do? We have to acknowledge it, like, okay, we, they gotta get their attorneys. Same thing with these deaths. We're not gonna leave bodies on the floor because all of a sudden we're gonna get down here to the end if it's tracking and they're managing it reasonably, this is well, but there are more deaths. Or better yet, it's a more accurate death because the deaths that y'all had, y'all don't even have the paperwork. There's no record. Madam Chair was very nice about those records. I, I'm just not that guy. It's like, where are the records at? Where are the records? But then we want to be convened about how we want to emphasize this data versus that data. Tell the whole story. Show the whole video. Don't just be convenient. So again, the coroner can pretty much, she, she has a right. You guys who hired her, hired her to make decisions. And again, we're not gonna leave bodies on the table, right? We, we're, we're, we're not going to leave them there. But she has a right to sort of bring a, a newness to this. It says, look, but I want everybody to have a, a death certificate. I wanna do what's right. So right now she is not, you wanna get into the like, okay, well, if she goes to training now, okay, she's gotta be kind of like my Smith supporters, I'll say again, that's on you. Right? You, you, you handle that what you think is reasonable, and if you think you can get through with that, then that's fine. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that. But there, is, there has to be a reconciliation of, of, of prior that if I owe somebody, and so I guess my question, my final question, 
to my finance director, which is uh, based on what Madam Chair just reported, and based on that report, um, 101,000 mm -hmm. was the number? Yes, sir. That it should have been, based on the historical? <coughs> yes, sir. And it came in to what, 63,000? Six. Just under 64. Six, six and change, that's fine, all right. So that means that um, there's a variance in what somebody should have been paid, correct? What, that's correct. 37, $37 36 dollars? All right, I'm good with my math. 37 thousand dollars that we owe somebody's in deferred compensation. I want the public to think about that. That this county, pretty much if you work for the coroner's office, it's like that guy sat up here and said to you, like, well, gee, so what do you do? They just sort of go give you a little bit and then get their friends more? Because based on this report, it looks like you had some above and below the number. So, okay, there was no consistency. I get why you don't want to go back and look at that. All right, I get that, okay, we're friends and you, you, know, you can't separate the two. See, I'm, I'm not that common, so I can ask and be very serious about the questions I'm asking. Like, no, I don't get in my way. Like, okay, I think that man deserves to get paid what he paid. Now, I know that this whole 37000 is probably not one person. Is that correct? It's probably multiple? Four. It's four people. I tell you what, at this point, because they begin to get into sort of an HR matter, it sounds like you probably, it, um, you're going to validate these facts. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you to talk to HR and our legal Ken, Would you think it would be an HR, issue, an HR topic to take offline? Ken? The, the pay issue? Yes. 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 Legal okay. land or HR. Legal land. That's what I thought. Madam. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, will you meet with um, Director Perry and Council? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of figure out a real answer and come back with an opinion on what really is. Who we should pay, who we should not pay, W9, W2. Can you reconcile that truth? Yes. It has nothing to do with criminal investigation. I just want to know if I owe somebody, I want to make sure they're properly paid. Okay. Can we do that? We can do that. Thank you, madam. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I think that's all I had, and unless the coroner was here, I would ask different set of questions, but I want to come back against those five that were asserted. Um, I, I, I think it's unfortunate, but again, it's nothing wrong with healthy debate. It's, it's okay with opposition and different opposing views. It's fine. I just, just, just keep it in a fair way, right? Just not make it personal. Let's, just keep it on the process and the facts. And Ms. Mulgar says, don't make it about the people. Madam Chair, I yield. Okay. Okay, I wanted to address some of the things that he um, was talking about with me. <coughs> Who'd you call him? Commissioner <laughs> Mitchell. All right, go ahead. <laughs> you guys have been debating. I mean, this is the business. I know, and I just wanted to clarify okay. some of the reasons. You just shot it. But what I would like to do, though, is. Um, I know there's a lot of conversations that being had. Can I can I ask that he come up here because no. I can't hear? I'll do it this way then. There's a lot of <coughs> conversations that's being had. I just think it's probably proper that we at least allow the corner to have this conversation to be a part of this whole conversation. Sure. I think here. we're all. She's here. She's here. Yes, quite. Well, I know she's here. That's that's why that's why I'm going to ask if if she would come forth and enlighten us as to where we are, what these conversations that oh or your your report of what that is and give you an opportunity to kind of share your side of the story and then i'll conclude at that point if you don't mind yes good morning good morning, good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all i want to say uh, in reference to the training in las vegas that training is for to get the uh coroner's office nationally certified Credited, and it would be in the only. This would be the only county in the state of Georgia to have that certification. That's what the training was for. Um, I have here my st statistical report for 2017 versus 2018, and I'm going to show you what we have and have have the difference in the uh, number of deaths. The primary purpose of the coroner office is to certify death investigation that fall under the jurisdiction of the coroner under Title 45, known as the Georgia Death Investigation Act. Not every death needs to be violent in nature. The coroner can investigate natural deaths as well. An example would be a decedent who had not been to his doctor in over a year yet died of natural causes. Doctors who have not seen the patient would not sign off on the death certificate. So that falls under the coroner and the medical examiner. Another example would be a decedent who is admitted to the hospital in an unconscious state 
and does not regain conscious within 24 hours. If they pass at the hospital within 24 hours, <coughs> that falls on the coroner's jurisdiction. Coroners as part-time employees. By definition, coroners and deputy coroners are part-time county employees. This means that the coroner's office is not their full-time job, but rather an on-call and as-needed occupation. This means that just like any other part-time job, coroners and deputies can and oftentimes do have other jobs outside of the coroner's office, responding to death calls and administrative duties as they arrive. Most full-time employers who employ part-time coroner deputies understand the commitment necessary to the coroner's office and allow the coroner's or deputies to respond to calls, even though it's part-time the coroner's office I like a part-time job. How part-time coroners different than part-time occupation. The primary difference with part-time coroners and deputies is that the coroner office has not has no set hours. Sometimes on call coroner for more hours than full time required. Other times the <coughs> office are shorter. Death calls for the primary duty of the coroner and death is unpredictable. Many coroners do require a certain amount of time in the office for him or herself in the deputy coroner. This fulfills the administrative duties associated with the job. The hours spent in the job do not stop when the investigation leaves the death scene. Many hours, days, weeks, even months can go into an investigation. Filing paperwork, speaking with family, corresponding with law enforcement agencies, and funeral homes, just a few of the deputies fulfill. Use a vehicle, corner vehicle, or any vehicle used to aid in a coroner's office and their duty. The most obvious would be a corner van used to pick up and transport <coughs> the decedent to and from the state medical examiner for other uses pertaining to corner business, such as attending meetings, picking up, dropping off records, paperwork, reports, etc. Any other deputy corner business with <coughs> local and state agencies. Douglas County Coroner Office SOP 9.1A vehicle policy. County vehicles are intended to be used for county business. However, policy allows for reasonable use of vehicles for personal errands by employees who are assigned vehicles on a 24-hour basis to respond to emergency situations. This policy covers the use of three corner vehicle by corner investigation and other corner office staff using the vehicle for official business. All employees who drive county vehicles must possess a valid driver's license and evidence of safe driving records. Corner may designate use of county vehicle as an out-of-county take-home vehicle. Reasonable judgment must be exercised in the use of county vehicle for personal purposes. Permitted use would include any use that results in negligible expense or is justified by compelling circumstances. For example, an on-duty investigator may use the vehicle for a person errand if errand is on the way to their business destination <coughs> or home at the end of the day, and the errand does not delay their responses to unseen or call. Certain circumstances arrive to warrant death investigation outside of the county. While the primary basis of death investigation occur within the county border, certain situations may bring the coroner or the deputies outside the county. If a certain situation results in death or subsequent passing of a decedent, even if the decedent passes outside the county border, it still falls under the coroner's discretion to investigate. For example, if an accident occurs inside the county, and the nearest hospital is in a neighboring county, a trauma center outside the county, the series of events leading to the decedent's inspiration occurred within county borders. Medical intervention should be accounted, but should not limit the incumbent the in investigation. If a car crash victim is a crash inside Douglas County, is taken to a hospital outside the county, Based on proximity to the accident, the Douglas County officials are to take charge of that investigation as that accident happened in Douglas County and should be included in Douglas County vital statistics. 
population growth effects and death volume. Population within a county is directly correlated with the volume of death in a certain county. Particular po population growth. Desert counties has experienced significant population growth over the last few years, particularly in 2017. According to MDJ, Douglas population saw a steady rise in residents inside the county, particularly in 2017, with nearly a 2,000 people a year increase. It stands to reason that with more people population increase, more deaths will occur. While death itself is unpredictable, it is trackable. Every other county which has experienced a significant population increase has also seen the rise in deaths and deaths caused. Douglas County is one point, has a 1.6 growth, double Cobb County in 2017 population increase of 0 0.7 and exceeded Georgia's overall growth at 1.3. Title 45 is known as Georgia Death Investigation Act and its former legislation pertaining to the coroner office. The coroner acts as department head of his or her constitutional office. Title 45 continues. Title 45 author authorized the coroner to write his or her own standard operation procedure or manual on office operation and personnel. Have as many deputy coroner as he or she sees fit delegate any and all responsibility to deputy coroner that, he's a she, that he and she chooses, delegate, oversees any investigation of decedent who case originated inside the county, in the case whether homicide, suicide, accident, or natural, even outside the county, which originated inside the county, reverts back to the county and is under the jurisdiction of the coroner. If a decedent originated inside the county and circumstances inside the county lead to his and her death, even if the decedent is transported for medical reasons or other outside of the county, since the circumstances leading to death originated inside the county, it is lawful for the county coroner to take control of that investigation. Deploy deputy coroner as he's or she fit. Search Instances may even require all deputy coroner to be at, at a scene. It is lawful within the county coroner's authority. Delegation of duties is at the coroner's discretion. This, this is the stats of the uh, decedent that passed away 2017 versus 2018. Uh, in 2017, from the ages of 0 through 50, you had 10 people to pass away in 17 and 9 to pass away in 18 between the ages of 0 and 50. Between the ages of 51 to 100 plus, you had 16 to pass in 2016 and 19 to pass in 2017. In February 2017, ages 0 through 50, you had eight, and in 2018, you had nine. In 2017, from the ages of 51 to 100 plus, you had 16, and in 2018, you had 22. In March, the ages of zero to 50, in 2017, you had nine. In 2018, you had 16. In March, the ages of 50 to 100 plus, you had 13 deaths. In 2018, you had 20 deaths. April 2017, 0 to 50, you had 4. 2018, you had 6. Ages 51 to 100. In 2017, you had 12. And in 2013, I'm sorry, in 2018, you had 13. And in May, from the age of 0 to 50, you had 2 in 2017 and 8 in 2018. And 2017, <coughs> you had 15 for 51 plus and 14 for 2018. These are our stats for the total of death, 2017-2018. In January 2017, 
you had 26 to pass. In 2018, you had 28 to pass. In February, you had 21 to pass, 24 to pass, and you had 31 in 2018. In March, you had 22 to pass, and in 18, you had 36. April, you had 18 in 2017 and 19 in 2018. May, you had 17 in 2017 and 22 in 2018. These are the causes of death. You had, in 2017, you had 5% of accidental death, 5% of suicide, and 5% of overdose. The other 86% was natural cause death. In 2018, you had 10% accident and 5% suicide, 86% natural cause. February 2017, you had 21% of overdose, 17% of accident, and 63% <coughs> natural cause. 2018, you had 7% accident, 4% homicide, and 89% natural cause. Large, we had 14% suicide, 14% accident, and 73% <coughs> natural cause. March 18, 2018, you had 24% accident, 5% homicide, 10% suicide, and 62% natural cause. April, you had 6% accident, 6% homicide, 6% suicide, 6% overdose, and 78% natural cause. April 2018, you had 13% suicide and 88% natural cause. 2017, May, you had 18% overdose, 6% suicide, 6% homicide, 6% accident, and 65% natural cause. May 2018, you had 6% suicide, 6% homicide, 22% accident, and 67% natural cause. Cases with weights over 200 pounds. In January 2017, you had 29%. In 2018, 29%. In February, you had 8%. 2018, you had 26%. In March of 2017, you had 27%. In March of 2018, you had 28%. In April of 2017, you had 17%. And 2018, 11%. May, you had 35% in 2017 and 36% in 2018. In 2017, there was nine cases with decedents over 300 pounds and one case with decedent over 400 pounds. So far in 2018, there have been three cases with decedents over 300 pounds, one case with decedent over 350 and one case with decedent over 400 pounds. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Uh, um, thank you, first of all. And, and I don't know, this may be more of a question for you too, Ken, as well, because I think I'm hearing a couple of different things. I, I've heard part-time, full-time, and I don't know, maybe you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think I heard part-time, which I thought that was the status quo of this particular makeup, but is that the case in Douglas County? Was it considered full time, or do you know? Oh, that's my first question. Uh, the deputies definitely are part time by contract. And they're paid right, no, I know about that. I'm talking the court. Yeah. The court is an elected official, not a constitutional office, meaning her dictates don't come from the state legislature, they come from local legislation through the state, not necessarily general law. Uh, she's under local legislation, House Bill 653, 
which governs her, and that's why y'all have to approve her third party contracts. Mm -hmm. As to full or part time, I don't think the law was clear. Obviously, right. when you don't know when somebody's going to die, it's a full part time job. Right. Meaning, mm -hmm. it's not written somewhere that this is a full time job yeah. or a part time job. But definitely, the deputy, deputies are part time. And, and, the, and you can probably understand why I'm asking that question because um, if it's part time, and you're trying to do what I would look at the labor law that we spoke about earlier. That would mean, to say, just from a, a, a legal perspective, it would be 20 hours, I guess, or no more than 30. You know, if you're going to do hour, if you're trying to speak on hours as a part timer versus a full timer. But we, I mean, we're not going to, I mean, I'm not going to get into the schematics, but I'm just trying to understand the difference of the two. But um, there, there is no, let, 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 I want to make sure this right. part is clear. I don't know about the history. Mm -hmm. But since y'all approved the deputies' contracts, they're paid on a per diem basis. Yep. They are legal within the Fair Labor Standards Act. There is no labor issue with respect to deputies under her con that are under contract approved by the board, at least from the time y'all approved the contract. Correct. So there is no minimum wage or hourly issue mm -hmm. with respect to those people, at least as of last year when we approved those contracts. I don't remember the exact date. But mm -hmm. I think May, maybe. Right. Yeah. June, May, June. Okay, okay, so with that, and, and I have to say, your choice in the matter was to, to approach it as a part-time perspective uh, and run your office accordingly. Yes. Correct, and with that, and, and, and the law doesn't state whether or not you could uh, have a, a, a well, even as a constitutional officer, as the sheriff, you can actually have him a, another job elsewhere, correct? It doesn't say that he or she can't, as constitutional officers, could have an additional uh, stream of income. Uh, I'm not, a, I'm not, I think the, the only requirement of the deputy, is, I mean on the corner, is to not violate the law, whatever correct. that would be, but I don't think there's a specific law that says that a coroner couldn't have another job. Or any constitutional office. Theoretically. Right. Right. Okay, that's, that's a good idea. Now, with respect to the respect to the deputies, their contract governs their ability to have part-time jobs, which y'all can control. Y'all cannot control what the coroner elects to do with, about having another job, so long as she fulfills the job that she has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the numbers that you gave us, the numbers that you gave us with the 2017, that was a lot of stuff, and I, I, I would love to get a copy of that so I can actually just kind of dissect it a little bit more so I can get, a, get my head arms around it. Did it also include, I mean, you could look at, I, I mean, a body could be touched or transported or moved <coughs> one, twice, or three times, depending upon the situation, correct? No, it doesn't. Oh. It just, those numbers are just the number of deaths. Got Not this. how many times they've been moving. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. So so that number could be a lot higher mm -hmm. or definitely a different number would, would, we would actually kind of look at because I would, without the transport numbers included in, in the numbers that you gave, um, could have been the, the numbers could be higher. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Cause I, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get my arms around your expenses, okay. kind of the true expenses. not. Because we, we can't predict, we don't know when that situation will occur. But we need to be there as a, as a board of commissioners to assure that whenever that happens, that the services that we provide as, with the coroner's help, that we're there to make sure that these families are taken care of, correct? Correct. So you can't give that number. At least you, you gave me the, the body count, mm -hmm. but you didn't give me the transport count. No. Because that number would be kind of be an additional expense, yes. depending upon how many times they move or or what's next with the body. Right? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you for the information. But I'd love to get. Will we have, be able to get a copy of that? So yes. Kind of really dissect that and look well, at it again. I can email it to everybody. Yes. Yes. But I'd love to get a copy of that though. So <clears throat> I yield back. Okay. Commissioner Guider. Uh, yes, ma'am, and uh, I just want to address the fact that uh, it was implied that I was friends with uh, uh, Randy. Uh, uh, I knew Randy probably as well as I do any of y'all. Uh, never came to my house. Sometimes I really saw him was at the chili cook-off, and uh, when he came to buy his tags, <clears throat> he was not a, he was an acquaintance, just like 
many people are acquaintances here. But um, my question started um, way back in 2017, and I wrote you a letter, sure right? You. And I uh, uh, spelled out in the email my concerns about how the office was uh, being conducted, and it, it was not just about you not doing a, a certain percentage of the work, but it was about the deputies too, so, and, and the billing of the deputies. So um, there was an internal audit. You called for an internal audit at that time, and they backed up what I said. And they even questioned why Miss um, Godwin was on site. Now, um, no, she cannot pick up a 200, 300 uh, pound body, but if you're on site, why didn't you do the investigation? I'm a team player. And let them do the transport. I'm a team player. I go out and I help them. Just but you like get you say, paid. You get paid a salary. Just, they get paid per call. Okay, just <laughs> like you said, I can't lift 200 pounds. There's been cases where they have 300 pounds. I help them lift 300 pounds. I'm not going to put my deputies in harm's way. And just because I want to go out there to assist them, I can do that. I'm a constitutional officer. I don't have to do anything if I don't want to. You're a constitutional officer. I am a constitutional officer. You're an elected official. You're an elected official. You're not a constitutional officer. But I run my office, and I run it how I want to run it. Well, um, but if you're on the site, uh, and this was uh, backed up with the internal audit, why didn't you at least do the investigation of the body and do the pronouncing? Um, but um, you don't transport bodies in your car. So your, your car is not used for transporting bodies everywhere. Only the vans are, right? That's so correct. when you went to Hateful, when you were working over in Hateful, I think you since quit that uh, that job, but you were on full time there. Were you not? Was it a part time or full time? Yes, yeah, so it was a, a full time job. And if I'm on call at the coroner's office, I if I get a call, I have to go to that call. And so I mean, if I'm in Hateful, if I'm in Alabama, if I get a call, I will have to leave, and I have my car accessible to go where I want to go when I get a call. So, uh, how many calls did you do? <coughs> I can't tell you how many calls. Three to four I months of the year. I couldn't tell you that. Well, you pronounced no deaths. Well, that's that's good. Back to October or of last year, you pronounced none of the deaths. So you had to be on scene to pronounce the death. So you were not on the you, scene. You, the deputies no, did it. You said I gave it to the deputies. I came on the scene, but I gave it to the deputies because you were there. That I was there. Mm -hmm. What do you mean I was there? How could you tell me what scene I'm on? Well, the sheriff's office, uh, they they do a report as to what coroner shows up. Okay. You probably didn't know that. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, the law, there is a law governing your deputies, is there not? Yes, it is. And it does say that you're to do the work unless you're It doesn't say the do coroner so. does the work. It, no, it doesn't. It says that the deputy does work in the absence of the coroner. It doesn't say specifically the coroner do the work. And if it say the that, you can I show it to me. does say that the coroner okay. is to do the work unless they are unable to do so, and then the deputies can. Okay. But uh, that's gonna. That's why, because of all this discrepancy, I don't know what's legal and what's just unethical. Well, just so that's why I turned it over to the DA, okay? And that, that's going to be settled right there. I but welcome that. <clears throat> my concern was the fact that in uh, 2017, two months in office, you came to us and you quoted all these figures and convinced us that uh, your work had doubled. Um, that there were 78 deaths in January, I mean, uh, calls not deaths. Now, I, a whole bunch of people die, but y'all aren't caught on every death. So there were 78 deaths, you said, in the months of January and February. Well, the uh, death certificates prove otherwise. They show 30-something. I can't remember the exact number, but half of what you told us. So we based our assumption that you needed all these deputies on the figures you gave us. That's so, not that's not why I requested 
condition of deputies. I requested the deputies that the prior coroner had the year before. The yeah, same yeah. deputies that I have is the same deputies that he had. The only difference I requested, like legislation say, and he did not. He just swore them in and they worked for him. He did not come to you guys and ask for additional deputies. Did you ask for so many deputies? I asked for them, but they was the same one that worked for Randy. I don't care who they were. I don't. I don't know. I did the right had. thing. I followed the <coughs> legislation. But you gave us wrong figures. And our action you would get the email, our, our, and you, you, you can check the law. Okay. Okay. Our action was based on that. But right. let, let me go on just with a, a couple other things. Um, so, if the law says that you're supposed to do it, except for with, uh, when you're unable to do so, how can you hold a full-time job outside the county in your county? vehicle by the way county gas being paid by taxpayers of uh, Douglas County you don't think that's an abuse I'm a part-time employee so I can work a full-time job part-time don't mean I have to come here from 8 to 8 to 4 or whatever I can come here anytime I can come at night and you don't get all your calls during the daytime you get calls at nighttime I have administrative paperwork to do just like any other head but you have an assistant in the office that does that, Mr. Baxter. He doesn't do everything. He doesn't do the other I handle employees. the administrative part as it relates to purchasing and if all of that stuff and, and my policy and trying to get my office accredited. <clears throat> well, like I say, that is why I turned it over to the DA because uh, that's for somebody else with a legal mind to determine. I think it's abuse, but that's my opinion. That's right. A lot of people think it's an abuse, but that's their opinion. I, I try to stick to the facts, and I always uh, investigate. When somebody comes to me and tells me something, I investigate to see if there's anything, data, that will back them up or, or contradict them. So I always do that, and uh, it is no personal vendetta I have against you. When you came to us and asked, when you were two months in the job, and asked for an 81% raise because this was a full-time job, you, you stated that, that this is a full-time job. This is not a part-time job, but you can hold a part-time job you told me job it was a part-time job in another county and, and do your work here. That is my, that's where I don't know where the line of being illegal and, and okay. just end up. Okay, I hear you. Let the district attorney figure it out. Not yes. Okay, so we, we're done. Any other comments? And I'll just wrap things up. Uh, thank you so much today, Coroner, for sharing your, uh, what, what's going on in your office. Very great information, good information, and I'm quite sure the citizens have a different respect for your office and the things that you're doing. Also, but I want to just talk about full-time uh, jobs for a part-time coroner. I had an opportunity to benchmark and look at other counties. Uh, these uh, part-time coroners in other counties have full-time jobs, and they are using their vehicles because they're on call 24 hours a day. So I was able to do some due diligence because, again, I'm very impartial, want to be fair, and I looked, so I was surprised to find out that they are. They have full-time jobs because $32,000 or whatever they make is not enough to subsidize the needs and, uh, and uh, the, the special needs of their families and you so say they had full time they job. had full full time jobs. Full time job. Yep, full time jobs in conjunction in conjunction. <coughs> we looked at three. And they're close by. So they have full time jobs. Close by. Yeah, close by. So we'll talk about those offline. Also, mm -hmm. um, as well I know uh, Commissioner Gotti, you said the DA has your information because mine has some things that vary some some regularities regarding the st Georgia state law. The, the pricing, the <coughs> swearing in. Uh, first of all, I've been in healthcare a long time, and I talked about this, and I'm, I, I, I was rather kind earlier. Mm -hmm. But we know that you do not sign Georgia floors and wards on anybody's death investigations form. So I, once we find these documents, and records are very important, and I have to have those records to move forward because it is a Georgia and a federal state law. So I'm looking for records, and when I find those, we can I'll, I'll provide another update to the citizens. But right now, uh, this investigation is in the hand of the district attorney as well regarding these numbers because I'm very I was blown away. wasn't looking for discrepancies, but 
wanted to know why there was a difference in 100 versus 175, and I just started just trending the information, and I was shocked. So, can I, can I ask you mm -hmm. a question? You said at the last meeting mm -hmm. that she was over her bu budget because of the number of cremations. However, the finance department has just said cremations are in line with. So it was not, it has nothing to do with cremations. Did she tell you that? No, she, she didn't have to tell me. I looked at it. I did see that the cremations, and that was me. I looked at it. She didn't give me any information about cremations. I looked at that, and also I was looking at it. But if you look at her death investigations, which are driven by the deputy coroners, I know we're saying they're up. But she's charging 175. They're not up. She's charging the present. So if you're kind of comparing, so what are we comparing her operation to? I have nothing right now to compare it with because his was erroneous. He was not charging by state law, and I keep saying law. And I want to—I don't want to try to be sound elementary, but law means the law. You charge 175, or you pay 175. We don't pay our deputy coroners 100 dollars. So I don't want to dig. I took a very deep dive. It was uh, it was a lot of hilarities, uh, irregularities that I discovered. That information, the DA has it, so we'll let him look at it, and he will he'll decide. Uh, any other questions from the Board of Commissioners before I move forward? Okay. I say move forward. Okay. Let's go to the next uh, item on the list. Thank you all so much. You have the approval of, of the minutes. The approval of the minutes for tomorrow. Please look at those as um, I will discuss those tomorrow and then we can approve accordingly. County Administrator, do you have any business today? No, ma'am. Okay. Tab number four. Authorization to accept the Federal <coughs> Transit Administration Grant, GA 2017-02301, for furnishing and equipment for the Transportation Center addition and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Mr. Gary Watson, there you are. Good morning. Madam Chair, uh, items four and five yes. are, are related. Okay. So with your permission, I'm going to talk about number five first, and then we'll go back. Okay, number tab four. number five, authorization to issue an invitation for bid for the construction of the addition to the Douglas County Multimodal Transportation Center. Mr. Watson, Director Watson. One of the projects that we have in our 2018 budget is to construct an addition to the existing Douglas County Multimodal Transportation Center. Uh, this will be a 6,200 square foot addition. It will have administrative offices uh, for multimodal staff and also for the county's office of risk and safety. We'll have a uh, suite for drug and alcohol training, uh, a driving simulator, a 40 person lecture hall, and, and a training bay uh, for van and uh, other vehicle <coughs> drivers. Uh, the, the main purpose for this addition is to improve the efficiency of our existing services. Uh, if we didn't add any other services moving forward, we would still need this building and facility for what we're, we're already doing. It's, this is uh, an estimated project of $1 million to $1.2 million. 80% uh, of it will be paid by a federal grant. Uh, our architect has finished all the designs and drawings of it, and we're ready to go out now and ask for uh, construction bids from contractors. And so that's what we're asking from the board today is to give us authorization to go out for bids. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Guyton? Yes, uh, Gary, do you have a rendition of it? Do we get to look at it? I've already sent that out, yeah. I, a good while back, I sent, I sent a floor plan and mm -hmm. a, a, a draw shot. Of yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> How long ago was that? I'm sorry. Uh, probably six weeks ago. Oh, Most that's six why. Weeks I ago. forgot it. <laughs> okay. But, uh, and the cost is what? One million to one point two. And you're, you're adding how many square feet? 6,200. And this is going to house uh, uh, the uh, training for the um, safety. Is, is he going to be down there too? Risk and safety, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be doing all the uh, blood tests and uh, when there's an accident, we always have to have a, a drug test. Yes, okay. ma'am. We will so, be able to do that in-house at our facility. Is that going to be saving us some money? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And, uh, we don't do it for the sheriff's office, though, and they do their own, right? Okay. All right. Thank you, Beth. Okay. 
Commissioner Mulder. Well, I, uh, this is going to be a, a multi-use expansion. Yes. From what you say, it's going to be uh, not directly tied uh, uh, apples to apples in terms of ridership. Correct. Uh, but my question is about uh, just more more curiosity question. Uh, the ridership has has dropped somewhat, mm -hmm. and but at the same time, over the last several months, uh, fuel costs have gone up. Have you seen any indication that, that uh, people are availing themselves of a ride share and on uh, and uh, the uh, express buses? Or uh, is it too soon to tell? And, and what, what's your uh, we're we're crystal ball say? We're beginning to see a little uptick. It's nothing real significant now but this this is something that's going on throughout the the metro Atlanta area related well actually throughout the nation uh, express bus ridership is down martyrship martyr ridership is down as well but it tends to be cyclical we'll go through a down period and and then in a little while we'll pick back up so just immediately with with the rise of fuel costs you just barely seeing any change right now. Right. If it, if it continues to go up, if it goes up, goes up over $3, we'll start seeing a, a pretty good yeah, increase. I, 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 I yield back, Chair. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Robson? Yeah, I, 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 I was sort of piggyback, but you, you noted about seasonality that, you know, when you're looking at data, it's not just one moment in time. You have to look at it over a period of time and, and see um, how it plays out. As relates to um, but, but to that point, um, when we talk about ridership, um, just this weekend, um, did we not start our public engagement um, to begin to educate people about the various services that we currently offer um, to the public so that... Yes, sir, it's um, going on there, correct. That, that, that the accurate statement. Um, the reason I ask that is that, as it relates to that facility, what are the things that I heard what you're going to offer there? What's actually in the transportation services center today? What are the core functions, just top level core functions that are performed there? Again, for the record, so people understand what's actually there. Well, certainly one of the main functions is administration of the overall multimodal program and all, uh, all the, the paperwork, documentation, uh, applications uh, that we do with with our funding sources uh, in addition to that we we have a customer service function in our building uh, for the express bus for our, our van food program for the voucher program and we also have a, a very comprehensive training function as well uh, for our van food drivers uh, uh, for drivers in the senior citizen program and also for the drivers in our voucher program and, and I appreciate it. I'll, I'll, I'll yield back after this so what I'm hearing is that is there an online version to I'm a senior I'm disabled I'm whomever do I, do I always have to come in or do um, can it be done online or can I do it by phone or uh, all know? of the above <laughs> All right, so in any form, so if I'm a senior, I just can't get over there. I mean, I, I just, I mean, I could, but it's a hardship. But what you're saying is that you will facilitate the intake process for an application on the phone, or for those who are um, um, technically savvy, you'll, we're able to also accommodate them as far as an online application. Because, you know, some parts of our government, we're just not getting our HR online. So I had to ask the question, is everything online or not? Correct, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just want to point out on these uh, FTA grant applications, for some reason the computer now on the agenda is saying that legal approved applications for these grants, we don't approve any grant application. All we do, if y'all approve the grant application, we simply review it to give Gary authority for the chairman to sign the document, meaning does the chairman have authority to sign this document based on board action. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure why that's being added, but we don't approve applications for grants. Mm -hmm. okay. Should we amend that? Can't, are you okay with just it as a work I think it needs to be taken off because it's not yeah. accurate. I don't know how it got on there. Okay. okay. Commissioner Gotti. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I do have some figures about the buses and the vans. Uh, the ridership from 2015 to 2017 is down 37.14. Mm -hmm. And um, that's on the vans. Now, on the buses, the Greta buses, it's down 30, 32%. Uh, 
that that's going to take a lot to make up. Um, and you you say it's because of gasoline prices. Well, there there are several different reasons why ridership is down. Obviously, gasoline prices are are one of them. Um, another factor is that more and more people are telecommuting, working from home, uh, not having to drive in. So that's not going to change. No, that's not going to change. That's probably going to grow. Yeah. And then an, another thing that hopefully will change back is that uh, a lot of agencies, particularly government agencies, are no longer paying subsidies for their people to ride public transportation. So it's, it's been several things that has contributed to it. But, but again, let me point out that this, this just isn't for our program. It, it's for uh, public transportation in general everywhere. Well, I was just taking our, our figures. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I yield back. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, okay. Director. Right. You're going to the next one. Ready for the next one? Now? Yes, we're ready for the next one. All right. If we're going to build this facility, we're going to need furniture and equipment for it. So we've received a, a, a new Federal Transit Administration grant to help us uh, purchase these items. Uh, again, this, this is a budgeted item in our 2018 uh, county budget. Uh, for this purpose, we'll be receiving $240,000 in federal funds, uh, which requires a $60,000 local match. And one of, the, one of the key components, one of the highlights of this, this furniture and equipment is a driving simulator that we'll be able to train uh, band drivers, uh, shuttle drivers, um, uh, county personnel who drive any type of vehicle will be able to utilize this machine. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, just real quick, to, to your point about the simulator, do other counties have a simulator? Or, I mean, if the preponderance of counties that have your function, do they have simulators? Or not really, that's just sort of a, a, a I won't say cutting edge, but it's sort of a progressive. Well, for for a program like ours, a program like our, our size, yes, sir. It they do have it. And, and, and so again, um, is there um, a profit center opportunity for other counties that may not have it? They can come over and certify <coughs> almost like our fire or what? I mean, do you is is there an opportunity there? I haven't looked at it from that perspective, but I'm always curious when I hear. Like we've got something that another county doesn't, can it be shared? Like if, if we're not using the simulator, can somebody um, schedule classes to come over and certify? I don't know. I mean, that, that's something that we can look in, but big, truthfully, I think it'll stay pretty busy with the, really? the people that we have. We, okay. Not When I say the people we have, I mean our program plus other county employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think so we should take this out? Or, or leave it? You think we're good? Yeah. Okay. All right. We're good. Thank you. Here. No, here. Okay. Thank you, Director Watson. Before I go any further, I would like to introduce our Board of Commissioners interns. They're here, excited and ready to go with, uh, for this uh, <laughs> wonderful internship and power pack rigor that we have planned uh, for them for the uh, next eight weeks. And I would like to introduce each one uh, individually. Uh, my intern, please see you all, and I'll ask you all, my interns, to stand and just, just give us some, some share something brief about you and what you plan to learn in this internship program. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce Leland Alexander, who is my intern. Uh, Leland, please stand and let's give him a hand, y'all. <laughs> Leland, please so, share. Um, I just finished my first year at Georgia Bennett College over in Lawrenceville. I graduated last year from New Manchester High School um, as well. I was in fame in the mastery chorus as well as the acapella group. They're doing great things. They just went to New York, like I guess what like a few months ago as well. Um, as far as what I'm trying to learn from this opportunity, I'm studying in business administration and as you guys know a lot of what we're trying to do is bring more economic, you know, progressiveness and opportunities into our county and we're doing pretty good at it so far. Um, and I wanna kind of piggyback off learning how to do that and as well as how that functions in government because of course as an entrepreneur you have to relay that onto yourself as well, how to interact with government officials and whatnot. And so that's what I'm looking forward to learning and helping along with the process to start. So good to meet all of you and I'm sure I'll see you guys again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Very good.
Commissioner Guyton's um, intern is Huntley Bradley. Hunter, hey. I don't know why I said Hunter. Hunter Bradley. Um, I graduated from Alexander High School like three weeks ago. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to major in business. Um, I want to learn from this experience and look, like, learn from local government and hopefully open up a restaurant here um, in the future. Um, I'm open to anything right now. But <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We next, next we have Commissioner Mitchell's uh, intern, Jasmine Moore. Jasmine. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jasmine. Hi, um, I'm Jasmine. I just graduated from Kennesaw three weeks ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I hope to learn, this has been very interesting being here. <laughs> <laughs> you picked a good day. <laughs> so, you know, I just want to learn from everybody and just, you know, just I may be here so I'm just really excited to be here. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> For Commissioner Mulcair, we have Serenity Hill. Serenity? Hi. 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 Um, I'm, as she just said, Serenity Hill. I just graduated from Alexander High School. Um, I was senior vice president. <laughs> senior vice president, board scholar, involved in various clubs and service projects. I'll be going to Kennesaw in the fall. I plan to major in communications. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think, like she said, being here today specifically <laughs> has been an eye opener <laughs> to what actually goes on behind this the way, scenes. This, way, very, this, <laughs> this is very interesting to me, and I actually enjoyed watching you all go back and forth and hearing the numbers <laughs> and seeing how everything weaved in together and how you all actually took the time. Actually, like, this is what's going on with your money, and you wanted the public to be so well involved. That's what I liked about this experience, and it's what I like to keep seeing more as I work here over the summer. So thank thank you. You. We can thank use you. more serenity. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, we have Anaya Gibson, and she's here for, she's uh, an intern for Commissioner Robinson. Anaya. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I see a few familiar faces from last year. Um, uh, hello, my name is Anaya Gibson. I'm a rising junior at the University of Georgia. I am a journalism major, Spanish minor. And yes, in terms of what I plan on learning, well, as you all know, I was here last year, and so, just like their experience being in the same workroom I was last year when I first came in for orientation, my same, I had the same response of, oh my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this is wild sometimes, like, okay. And so coming back again, you know, I told them like, okay, the work meetings can get, like, they get things done, so just prepare yourself. And so even being here again this year, I'm like, yes, yeah, same old, like, definitely getting the work done. And so my plan is to, um, when my plans of being here this year is just to build upon the you know the knowledge that I learned last year having the knowledge last year coming in here again um, from the inaugural class um, I've definitely learned a lot and I believe that coming here again I can maybe even apply the knowledge that I learned last year even help my fellow interns in terms of you know just apply some of the knowledge that I gained and also because I'm a journalism major, I'm now taking my official major classes this coming year, maybe incorporate some of my journalistic skills that I learned from the classes that I took last year at school and incorporating it into the county government, maybe in writing articles or just pitching some ideas in terms of context and creativity to help in our government because I'm a citizen, you know, seeing the behind the scenes works only makes me want to be a part of that as well. So that is all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all and welcome the board and buckle up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, tab number six. We'll keep the meeting rolling right along. Tab number six, authorization to approve a claim for a property tax refund for the Pavilion Church Incorporation. As recommended by the Board of Assessors and Tax Commissioner and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Waldrop, how are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This, is a, this is a little simple case. Okay. And typically, y'all would not see it, but it's more than three years, so we fell out. The other two years had to be approved. What happened was the Pavilion Church owns two pieces of property on Chapel Hill Road. 
the house with the lot, and then there was a second lot next to it. They back back in 2013, they combined the two pieces of property into one parcel, mm -hmm. and we made that the main house parcel. The acreage was put on that parcel, and they've been paying taxes on it ever since properly. They never have filed for any exemption or anything. But we didn't board out the parcel they combined, so they paid taxes on that boarded out the vacant parcel 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. And they needed, uh, we found it in an internal audit as we reviewed properties. And we felt like they needed to be reimbursed for those years they paid double taxes. And that's all that is. It's not over the $2,000 limit in any year, but it's more than three years, which is our legal ability to go back. So, so all five years are before you. We recommend that it be approved. Okay. Any comments or questions from the Board of Commissioners? Ben, Benny, if I can answer. Yes. Has Bob looked at this? He did. And Bob thinks you can go back more than three years? He does. Okay. If the Board of Commissioners approves. We can. Right. Yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what he, Bob's recommendation was. The Board of Assessors cannot go back for three years, but it can come before the Board of Commissioners, and y'all have the authority mm -hmm. to go back the extra two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Gardner. Well, thank you, ma'am. Um, it was really just a mapping error. When mapping is our file on our side, we the mapper properly mapped it as a one parcel. We properly did the paperwork to make the parcel go from the lot from the house and lot to the house and two. now two, two lots, lots. Mm -hmm. but we didn't board out that was our side we should have what do you mean one. board out if we should have boarded out the vacant parcel it should have been removed from our records if we, we were had pretty like it had, had never been combined so we, they were paying taxes on the vacant lot that was part of the the improved lot after it had been combined it's like we, they, we, we missed the combination on our side. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Any other? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Tab number seven, authorization to accept a check from the law library in the amount of $25,000, $25,347 from the purchase of a four fifty-five inch Mondo pad pads and related equipment to be used in the Superior State Juvenile and Master Street Court. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Holman, yes. Director Holman. Uh, these funds were coming from the Law Library Fund. Um, they wrote the check and we're holding it in the Finance Department mm -hmm. upon approval. They'll approve this item tomorrow. I did check with Russ. I don't think he said yes. He had to step out. Okay, yeah. I did check with him prior to the meeting and uh, Asked him if it ran through the technology committee. He said this particular item did not, but there was something very similar about six months ago. Mm -hmm. And he said these Mondo pads are getting very common, just like laptops. Yes, sir. So there was no problems or issue within the technology. Mm -hmm. That's correct. I talked right. to him also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Robinson. How much? Forty. Forty-five. Uh, four of them. Uh, for twenty-five thousand three hundred forty-seven. I, I got it right. Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask is, um, I mean, everything doesn't have to be run through a committee and stuff. I think it can be an acquiesce. And I, I mean, I'm glad that Mount Guy just said it because that was a question I had. So mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. Um, does these Mondo pads come with technical support? Um, and this is very practical. We're, we're, our experience with the Mondo pad is such that maybe Russ can answer and we don't have to do it now. But I think there's a, <coughs> it's, it's advanced enough where if you're on the dime and you need to get something done, and I'm especially thinking about my, our peers over there in judicial where you got lives at stake, right? We, we got the, the, I mean, this is still the business of the people, but I just think from a, a practical use, to, to, can we make sure that there's some type of technical support to make sure we know how to use that tool? Can we just make that as a footnote? And I don't know if there's an extra cost, but I just, I, I, we're experiencing this board of commission, like, okay, that's killing me. Like, why can't that thing work right? Right? But what is the problem with it? And so I think you understand the spirit. I mean, our staff, I mean, these, they do a great job making these things work for us, right? And so I'm just trying to make sure that our judicial, who's on a different time schedule, because they've got lives and they got, you get my point. Can we just make a footnote of that? Yes, I'll send an email sure. to uh, mm -hmm. Russ and let him know. Yes. All right. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Mr. Okay. 
moving on. Thank you so much, Director Holman. Mm -hmm. We'll move to tab number eight. Tab number eight, authorization to accept an award from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council in the amount of $227,438 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, how are you doing? Hi. Mm -hmm. Back day today, how are you? Um, this is the annual grant that we've received for the last several years from Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. It provides services to children that are coming through juvenile court, um, skill-based um, services that um, we run for over the summer and through the year. Thank you. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Come in. No. Good. We'll move on to tab number nine, authorization to accept a grant in the amount of $54,636 for the Family Treatment Court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Mrs. McDade again. Yes, this is our uh, regular family treatment court grant where we work with parents that have deprivation cases filed in juvenile court and they um, sign up to be in our family treatment court and we provide them with more intensive services to help them um, work on their addiction issues. Okay. Any questions for Mrs. McVeigh? Yes. Commissioner Ross. Yeah, real quick, just for the record, deprivation cases are mm -hmm. cases in which neglect within child abuse abandonment. and neglect cases. Ma'am? They're child abuse and neglect cases that the Department of Family and Children Services receive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, the, so and that they is, make referrals to us. They do come in. I was looking for how they came into us. Okay, yes. you've answered it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Tab number 10, authorization to accept funds from Cobb Douglas uh, Public Health for backup redundant communications in the amount of $2,604 and amend the fire department's budget. Uh, Chief Spencer, good this morning. Uh, good this, now. Yes. this is a grant that uh, uh, Cobb Douglas Public Health has been giving us for probably the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, basically, it's uh, backup communications, so we use that to help pay for our phones. Uh, it's a great relationship with them. We work well with them. We've helped them with uh, a lot of their projects, and they in turn have helped us with some of our projects. So it's a good partnership. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Kind of? Sounds good. You have anything? Okay. And we'll move to tab number 11. Authorization to upgrade the pumper truck for the fire department uh, purchased in 2017 with additional safety related equipment. Chief Spencer again. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we, we did talk about this in our fire and EMS committee meeting. Uh, these were some safety additions that we added to our pumper truck, uh, which added a cost of about $7,400 on to our, what we had bid the truck for. So we wanted to bring it back to the full board just to make you aware that. Uh, we, we need to spend this extra money. Uh, they are safety related issues. Uh, probably the biggest cost would be for the additional lighting, mm -hmm. uh, emergency lighting. So as we go through intersections, they can see us coming through the intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also added uh, disc brakes to the front. We added a steel bumper instead of a chrome bumper. Uh, and then we also added uh, bus style mirrors, which are mounted to the body, not just to the door. So. Okay. Any questions from the board? Commissioner Geiger. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Chief, uh, when we bid out for these trucks, we don't have specs that well, require the steel bumper, the disc brakes, and et cetera? Well, th this particular truck, the, the bids that we bid out, uh, they met part of them, but didn't meet all of them. Uh, and that's kind of the way we, it was a loose bid. We call it a loose bid uh, because <laughs> this this truck was already in production when we, when we accepted the bid, so we we were able to change some of the stuff. Uh, that was one of the things, we, or some of the things that we we changed. We didn't realize that they didn't have the lighting, and that was the, the big thing. So so how much is this going to cost? Is this coming out of splash? Yes, this this is splash this, uh, upgrade. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and it, we're still under budget on this particular truck, uh -huh. uh, the truck and equipment. So it's coming basically out of the, the equipment side of the truck. For the 2017 yes, allocation? Yes, ma'am. Not the 2018? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Commissioner Robinson? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Chief, we talked last week, and, yes, and so I just, just for the record, so 
um, regarding this topic. Um, and again, it, it's tied to the SPLOST, uh, specifically a pumper truck. Um, I think I was trying to make sure I understood the, or distinguished the difference for, um, like we've got a new fire station that's being built um, eventually um, out in District 2 off of, of Thornton Road. And when I think about industrial fires versus house fires, and for, 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 the, for the record for the public, um, does a does a pumper truck? Do we need different size pumper trucks to handle a fire? To, talk about what you talked about last week, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, all of our pumper trucks are rated at least uh, 1,500 gallons of water per minute, which that's a whole lot of water. Right. Uh, and uh, they're multi-use vehicles, so they can handle the small structure house fire, residential fire, or they can also handle uh, a large commercial fire. Uh, in large commercial fires, most of the commercial buildings have sprinkler systems that are already built in. Yes. Uh, a lot of them down on Thornton Road, they have internal fire pumps that increase the pressures uh, for, for the sprinklers. Uh, and of course, we always send more than one truck to a structure fire, so uh, if we send two of these pumpers, then you know we've got 3,000 gallons of water a minute we can be flowing. So the, the pumper truck is, is the workhorse of the fire department. Right. That, that's your, your main vehicle that we use to fight fires with. And, and that's all I was just asking, make sure I understood. And again, I'm, I'm glad to hear there was appropriate allocation for this out of this floss and that the team um, is oversight is, is making sure that it's done. Um, but again, um, for example, when we had that explosion right there. Yes, sir. Um, this pumper truck would be a tool that would be used to help help deal with that or uh, we used about six pumper trucks that night. <laughs> okay, that's, that's we what we didn't want to, the big tank to go boom. Okay. That, that's what I'm trying to get, you know, how does it work? How do the assets use? So you pull from different stations, we bring them all in there, depending on the size. That got into my whole point about if there's a big fire, um, a warehouse fire on um, Riverside Thornton, whatever the case may be, again they've got internal, but sometimes it doesn't work. You see it on TV, it, it goes up and it's like all these trucks. So I just want to understand, are we properly uh, equipped? And it sounds like we're, we're doing good. Yes, sir. We actually have one uh, brush truck that we use for off-road fires. Yes. Uh, it's a smaller truck, uh, but the pump on that truck can still pump uh, 250 gallons of water a minute. So it's mm -hmm. uh, for, for wood fires, that's that's very good. So. A dog with a park or something, we got got to get all the way in there. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the chief? Thank you so much, chief. Thank you. Uh, 12, tab number 12, authorization to approve an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Villa Rica for an early warning signal for the railroad crossing at Mirror Lake Boulevard and Connors Road and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and which are subject to final review. Director Valentine, how are you? Doing great, how are you? Doing great. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, this yeah. item apparently has been also in the works for quite a while, <laughs> and uh, what uh, what the city uh, wants to do is be able to put a an advance warning railroad a symbol signs on the mm -hmm. approach at the intersection of Connors Drive and uh, Mirror Lake Boulevard, and the idea is that traffic right now, uh, if they are turning either left going westbound or right coming south and turning westbound uh, at that intersection of Hunter's Drive could be stopped at the railroad and not realize it and then have to turn around and come back and double back. What this signal will do is connect to the railroad mast arm. So when it goes down, it energizes the advance warning uh, signal and lets people know that if they turn right, uh, the uh, railroad is going to be impeding their path, they may choose to go around a different way. So um, because the work is being done in the city, uh, it requires uh, intervention or assistance from the county. What the city would, um, uh, what the agreement will do is allow for the county to actually manage the project, bid out the project, and uh, administer it on behalf of the city with the city reimbursing the county for the expense. <coughs> There is a component also of this project that the city will have to enter into an agreement directly with the railroad for the portion of the work that they have to do. So it's a two-part project, um, all uh, city responsibility. Um, when the project is completed, 
then uh, the city continues to be responsible for its operation. However, because of the expertise that the county has in traffic operations, uh, they will uh, rely on us to perform uh, and monitor uh, repairs or monitor the, the operation, uh, but any expenses incurred by the county uh, in doing so would be reimbursable by the city. Any questions on City Commissioner Guyton? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank goodness. <laughs> this has been going on for uh, two, three years, I know, but I've been in the conversation. <coughs> I want to commend, uh, you know, the city or whoever got this done, the local legislators. I know I talked with uh, Senator Dugan, and I know others have talked with uh, the other le legislators. It's hard to deal with the railroads. Yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, they, they're monopolies, so they, you know, they are, well, anyway. Uh, but uh, this is a long time coming, and I, I'm just very thankful for it. I know the people of Mirror Lake are going to be very thankful to it. Um, and also, I just want to interject this. The red lights at Man Road and Highway 78 are working. <laughs> They, we now have a red light there. We had wrecks there every other day, but uh, finally the DOT installed the, uh, the lights. And I'm thankful for that. But, um, and while I've got him on, at the podium, can I ask just one quick question about the truck, truck lanes on Thornton Road? I was down on Thornton Road the other day, and it was just a sea of trucks because of the hub, the piggyback hub down there in Austell. Are they going to, when are they going to do the truck lane uh, on Thornton Road? Does anybody uh, know? I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I'm having trouble finding that item on the agenda as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, having said that... I like to surprise people. <laughs> but uh, having said that... Um, <laughs> there, there, is, uh, there is additional work that's being done uh, for traffic flow along uh, Thornton Road. Mm -hmm. there, there was a study that was commissioned probably four years ago now, and there is a project that is being designed by the Georgia DOT to assist with the uh, trucking situation. I mean, it, it, was, it looked like a, a parking lot for trucks down there. It was, it was awful. <laughs> And I can't imagine what it's going to be like when the, the port down at uh, Savannah is opened up more. So anyway, I yield back. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions for Director Bellamy? Thank you. Great job. Um, you're really excited about the railroad crossing that has yes. been wide. All right. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? Yeah. Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, real, real quick. Um, two, two quick things. Um, uh, we, we've got two committee meetings that will be coming up um, in which I chair. One is going to be the finance, um, and we've got one agenda item that we're going to talk about, Jennifer. We're going to cover several agenda items. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You want to name a couple of them just for the highlight? And what, well, one in particular I think is important. Um, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. You're talking about the one uh, two weeks from today? Yes. Um, yes, we'll be having one talk about um, let me remember, Michelle, it's on the agenda. Um, county property, um, the audit, um, the update on the tax abatement project. Um, am I missing anything? I think that's it. Those are the key ones. Okay. No, that's good. And one, the one I wanted to highlight was the property. Mm -hmm. uh, what, one of the things, um, my fellow commissioner Mitchell did a great job of being instrumental in. Um, helping facilitate the sale of our jail that I've always said, you know, let's count the business and so forth, but it, it, we, we finally did it. We're, we're, we, we, transaction's done. But we have other assets that the county own that I know that we, we pick up assets from time to time, right? Some of them could be left over from other transactions and some of them there's things like we just happen to pick up um, um, that we actually own. So the question becomes like, well, let's do an inventory of our assets. Should we hold them, fold them, sell them, swap them, whatever the case may be? But I, I think, that, again, one more time, I'm always hearing about the spend, right? I'm like, okay, guys, there's got to be other ways to, to, to look at managing a government, right? So, um, again, as part of our long-term um, capital planning process, we're beginning to look at all of our assets and bring back to the Board of Commissioners. And they may not do, do nothing. I mean, I think it's a matter of what we have to inventory what we have 
And when you look at it, it's not that we never had a list, we've had a list. But the question is, we never have gotten to a place where should we be disposing of assets that we really don't have? I mean, guys, we're not in the real estate business. We're not McDonald's. Why do we have these assets that are sitting here? Maybe we can save them, put them in our little fund or whatever the case would be. So that's one of the things we're going to take up as a finance committee. And so um, stay tuned for that. Um, you're welcome to come attend that. The next one is the Transportation Committee. Um, and I'll, I'll just, Miguel, I think the, the key item that I think I mentioned is that we want to make sure we cover uh, the budget regarding buses. We, don't, we recognize there's an impending ARC decision. Uh, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into sort of what the budget was submitted for the application. Also, Jennifer, we talked about making sure that we had an analysis uh, from uh, using our new tool and what the budget impact would be on our general fund. So we're going to get a little bit deeper into the numbers regarding that. We welcome anybody out to uh, participate to that. That is not a public input meeting on that day, but you're more well than welcome to come and observe. And so I'll just leave it at that, Madam Chair. Just want to give people a heads up um, on these um, committees and do a better job of letting people know what we're, what we're working on. Um, it's, it's not a shadow government. We, we're not secret service. We, we really want to do well. And so we welcome you guys to come out and participate. And if not, read the meeting minutes or look at the video. Um, and you. Okay. Any other comments from, from the Board of Commissioners? Okay, at this time. Madam Chair, can I one yes. more while we're in the open session? Mm -hmm. uh, I had a little bit of concern about the tax refund because I remembered in my mind it was a three-year statute limitation of refund that mm -hmm. earlier Benny said. I want y'all to know it is three years. I looked at the statute. They have th uh, one year on certain taxes, three year on property taxes, request for refund from an erroneous or overpayment that was made. And so three has been what we've told y'all all along. And y'all have applied that to other situations where they were beyond three years and they requested refunds and y'all only gave them for the three years. So I wanted to make, I even called Bob Coons during the break or during my break mm -hmm. to make sure and I think essentially it was set up here because they felt like it was a good thing to do, but it, it, it is going to create for you a difference of how you treated others in mm -hmm. the past, other administrations have treated others, and it will set a precedent yeah. going forward, which I would caution you all about. Okay. Commissioner Geyer. If I recall, <clears throat> we've done this in the past. Uh, we have gone back more than the three years. The law states that um, to NOD somebody, in other words, it's our error, we left them off the digest. We can go back seven years, but when we do an error in the uh, office and we overtax them, we can only go back three years. There's always been an argument, it, it's not fair. <laughs> but I, I, I think I recall several instances where we went back more than three years. Y'all hadn't, if I've been sitting here, I don't know if anybody else has sat here, I'll read you 485380. I know it says three years, but I'm, I'm just saying. Any taxpayer uh, from whom taxes or license fee was collected who alleges that such tax or license fee was collected illegally or erroneously may file a claim for a refund within the, with the governing authority of the county or municipal at any time within one year or in the case of taxes three years from the date of payment of taxes or license fee to the county and municipality. So there's a three year statute on it. Yeah, we'll just I, well the only problem is that this the they didn't catch it. The assessors didn't catch it till recently. And neither and did it's the payer. Their error. And neither did the payer as well. There's some responsibility on the taxpayers. That's why you have a yes. taxpayer's bill of rights as to how to protect yourself when there is an error. So what they've done by this statute is the legislature has come up with a balancing act. Mm -hmm. We'll give you three years if we're wrong, but we're not going to go back indefinitely because of budgets. I mean, this, this could have more impact than just this <coughs> one entity if it were taken to its full extent. But I believe, as your counsel, that the statute is three years from the payment on property taxes. Mm -hmm. And I've said that before. Now, <coughs> if there's some deviation from that, I'm not aware of it. And I think the Board of Assessors is aware of it, too, because I asked Bob, Bob, do you think we have authority? Well, you are the Board of Commissioners, but I don't think you do. I think it was just sent up here because they felt uh, emotional empathy for the requester. And I get that. I'm not, not getting that. But the law is three years. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we definitely want to follow the law, the level of the law. So um, then we need to look at the, 
and again revise something? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I mean, y'all can do whatever you're going to do. Your lawyer's advice is to give them three years tax credit if you decide that you're going to a refund or whatever it is. Yeah, three years. If you're going to go that far, if you're going to go beyond that, I think you may be exceeding the bounds. Now, I did the research in five minutes, but I read from the statute. You know, I love research, so right. let's stay with the, with the law. You know, we're glad to further see if there's any other examples from the Attorney General. I also know you couldn't go back seven years because the time for filing suit is five years or less if there was suit through appeal process because that statute further down talks about no matter what, you can't sue more than five years out if you went through an appellate process. Well, let's stay within the level of the law. It's three years. Commission, Vice Chairman Robinson. No, I, I, I'm listening to the, the conversation, and again, I it's duly noted what counsel said, but again, I'm sort of like, yeah, I think you're right. For some reason, I think, I mean, again, we go back at least back to 2010, and a, again, sometimes it's that nod, it's that phone call, it's that what skits and tells, but sometimes things just feel, you know, the law wasn't applied at that moment, but now we're, again, we're, we're, we're applying the law. And, and it's, that's what I'm like, well, I'd still like to know, have we ever done that? So how can we find out the real answer is that, have we ever given a, I mean, it shouldn't be that many, so it shouldn't be a hard file to go find, but I, I mean, Madam Guider, and I, I mean, I knew it, I'm just asking, if the board wishes to know the truth, have we ever done it a different way? I hear that we're, it's being suggested going forward, but I'm just curious that we ever set a precedent already that has already exist. I think, I, Lisa, Lisa, in your computer, if you were to do a search in the minutes, could you find tax credit tax appeals? Because you could easily go back and do that if your computer reveals it that way as an index. Yes, I could. We can check it over the next 24 hours if y'all you, you Yeah, just like something it. simple. I mean, I'm not asking you to, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Madam Chair, if that's your pleasure. That's fine. We'll just look at it, but of course, yeah. I love the matter of the law. Yes. Uh, Ken, I'd appreciate if you'd read that statute again, because what I heard was you couldn't file uh, outside of three years. It didn't say anything about making, making a refund. Would you read it again? I will. And I, 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 I may have misheard it. Yeah. Oh, well, I also have not read the annotations, and I'll be glad to find those between now and tomorrow. Uh, I'm reading only a portion of 48538. It says any taxpayer, I might make it big, I'm sorry. Any taxpayer for whom a tax or license fee was collected who alleges that such tax or license fee was collected illegally or erroneously may file a claim for a refund within the governing authority of the county and municipality any time within one year or in the case of taxes three years after the date of payment of taxes or license fee for the county or municipality. Now, what that means is if you pay taxes four years ago, you can't file it now for a refund on something you paid four years ago. So it is a statutory limitation, a bar to an action, three years from the time of payment. That's why they tied it to the date of payment. Mm. It's, it's, it's still brief in my mind, filing within three years, but the filing could go back four or five years. The filing is within three years. Well, I'll give you an example. Let's, let's say this. Let's say that the error occurred five years ago. Under this statute, if you pay taxes five years ago, you could not file. Because <laughs> you have to file three years from the date of payment. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't write the law. I'm just reading it. But my interpretation <laughs> okay. is a three-year bar. But we'll, I, listen, I get it. <clears throat> I'll dig deep to see if there's any attorney general's mm -hmm. opinion or anything that authorizes outside that matter. Okay. I'm it glad did, to. It just seemed like a limitation on the filing time, time period, not how far you can go back. Well, it's just, like a, if you get in a car accident, you got two years from the date of accident to file, you can't file three years. Well, it's well. a bar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that the same? Okay. All right. Uh, Thank any you. other yes. questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? At this time, um, County Attorney, do we need to go yeah. into executive session? Uh, uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I just want to make sure y'all knew. That applied to illegal taxes and erroneous taxes. So that covers errors, just so y'all know. That statute I was referring to. But I'll, I'll check. Okay. It's both erroneous and illegal or messed up or whatever. We are going to need an executive session for personnel and litigation. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? No. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back. Thank you. Okay. Lights, red light, and green light on these cameras. I know. I can't understand what we're doing. If you got to give me some more money program, we'd go buy some more. Hey, we did bring up those legal pads. Okay, thank you all. We're back. Any other questions yes, or concerns from the Board of Commissioners? Yes, uh, Chicago Chairman of the Technology Committee, we made a comment 
um, during, um, I think it was Jim McDade or someone that was buying yes. uh, new equipment. Yes. Um, right. yeah. uh, and we acknowledge great job, all of that, everything doesn't have to come between the Board of Commissioners as long as the committee acknowledges. The point was technological support. In other words, I just there's got to be a better training and transfer, right? We intuitively know how to use laptops and stuff, but we've had too many instances where we've tried to use that monopad up there and just I don't, I mean, there, there has to better, be a better orientation for that. And I don't know if you can buy orientation or buy training, but if you're on that judicial side, you're dealing with life and so forth, and they're trying to get, they're trying to make that thing work. Mm -hmm. Where's the technical support? Maybe you can't buy it, maybe it's staff. But I just, we struggle a lot with this thing, and I hate that experience. And then now you're going to take that over to the judicial side. They're like, oh, this is cool. Like, yeah, but it got to work. You don't want to be frustrated when you're trying to build a case these attorneys are arguing and they're going between their exhibits and doing all that, stuff, whatever they're going to be doing with that. I just think that can we make sure that they got the proper support to be able to use that as a tool and that it, it, this ain't, that ain't no play. It, it, it hasn't worked at certain times when we really needed it. And that's all. We did that. Okay. Well, we used to have a staff person that trained them. Uh, and on computers, when you change uh, the system from a 2007 to 2010, yes, you do need retraining. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're talking about going to 365, so uh, uh, we need to have somebody that can train our staff on this and other things. And then, and, 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 and yes, yes, that's, that's, that's you guys. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was all. I don't know about Whatever you guys come mm -hmm. back with, mm -hmm. we just sort of acknowledge me. I don't want you to miss. Oh, and I guess I know we, there are some times when you're trying to swipe and pull and stretch, and you know, and it's like, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we get it. All right. Okay. That's with that being special. said, <laughs> any other questions <laughs> or comments? With that being said, this meeting is adjourned. All right. <laughs> <laughs>